Hi, uh, this is John Boyne and welcome to this Alliance Francaise event. Uh, I'm going to be reading from my new novel, which is called A Traveller at the Gates of Wisdom. Um, this is a novel which is set across 52 countries uh, and a space station, beginning in the year one in Palestine and finishing in the year 2080. And the premise of the novel is that while everything around the world changes through those millennia, uh, computers, industry, technology, our emotions remain the same, no matter where you are, and no matter what country, and no matter what time in history. So the section I'm going to read comes from the beginning of the novel, uh, which is set in Palestine in the year one. On the night that I was born, my father Marinus left our home while my mother was in labour, and over the eight hours that followed, slaughtered a dozen infant boys, the sons of our neighbours and friends, each one under the age of two years. He owned four swords, including a pair of gladii and an ornamental sika that had been handed down through three generations of our family. But he chose the smallest weapon in his arsenal, a triangular dagger with a wooden handle and silver blade, known as a parasonium, to end each of the baby's lives. A ruby jewel of considerable value lay at the centre of the quillion, its liquid blush ready to reflect the blood that spilled from the bodies of the children. A man of duty, he did not hesitate as he marched from door to door, searching each house for hidden nurslings, before plunging his knife into the heart of every boy he found. And while mothers screamed in horror and rained curses down upon his head, fathers stood silently in corners, mute and impotent, knowing that if they dared to speak, the blade would surely find its way across their throats before their sentence came to an end. Older siblings trembled in fear as they watched Marinus go about his dark business, soiling themselves, frightened that they too were about to face the judgment of the gods for some unspecified crime. But no, once the babe had been dispatched from this world for the next, my father barely glanced in their direction before making his way to the next house and the next and the next after that, for there were more babies to discover and more lives to bring to a premature end. After each murder, he wiped the blade clean on his tunic, the fabric growing increasingly discoloured as the sun began to peep over the horizon in the east, a fiery witness to unspeakable crimes. Of course, Marinus was not the only man engaged in bloody misadventures that night. More than 30 other soldiers had been deployed by King Herod to the towns that surrounded Bethlehem, until more than 300 infant boys were put to death for the crime of being a potential king of the Jews. When my father returned home in the early morning, his spirit died with a barbaric tint that could never be erased. I was suckling at my mother's breast, and he placed a trembling hand upon my skull, resting it there for a moment as he gave me his blessing and begged forgiveness from the, from the immortals atop Mount Olympus. When he took it away, a trace of blood was left in its wake, a deadly deposit, and I've always wondered whether some residue of his crimes remained indelibly upon my soul, a tattoo invisible to all but the eyes of the gods, a reminder of the massacre of the innocents that was taking place as I filled my lungs with air for the first time. There is, of course, an unhappy irony to the fact that he dispatched a dozen babies from this world, for he would be responsible for bringing the same number into it over the course of his life, although few would survive past their infant years. He also saw off four wives, although none, I hasten to add, at his own hand. And while my mother, Floriana, was the last woman to marry him, she would not be the last to share either his bed or his home. Marinus's first marriage took place when he was only 12 years old, a forced contract with his cousin, Unia, the ritual taking place in a stole temple in the town of Zatara, where they were both born. The marriage was not a success. His father and uncle, greedy men with cruel dispositions, spent their lives slipping between periods of hostility and camaraderie, and their children paid the price for their inconstancy. The couple being so young, it was said that all four parents stood on either side of the wedding bed on the night of the ceremony, issuing crude instructions to their naked, frightened offspring on how to achieve consummation. And when Unia fainted in distress and Marinus burst into tears, they were soundly beaten 
and informed that they would not be permitted to leave the marriage chamber until the act had been completed to everyone's satisfaction. Unia died less than a year later, giving birth to a son, my brother, Junius, her fragile young body so ill-prepared for motherhood that it was torn apart by the trauma of childbirth. Although saddened, my father must have grown accustomed to the pleasures of matrimony, for he took a second wife almost immediately, a servant girl named Livia, who gave him half a dozen more children, most of whom survived only a few months at most, before she was caught in a rainstorm, succumbed to a fever, and died of it within a week. And then there was a third wife, Capella, who tumbled into a well while under the influence of wine, and was discovered months later, her body already in an advanced state of decomposition. And a fourth, Riza, who was found hanging from a rope, a victim of her own malaise. Marinus had been fond of his wives and was, by all accounts, a more considerate husband than many in Bethlehem, never raising a hand to any of them in anger, but he had never truly loved them. That emotion was reserved until shortly after his 22nd birthday, when he laid eyes on my mother for the first time. And although he would not remain faithful to her, monogamy being an unnatural concept to him, I believe that he felt a deeper emotion towards his fifth wife than he had towards any of her predecessors. My father loved women, all women, and was as indiscriminate with his favours as a dog in heat. He said that tall women excited him, but short women were good for his soul. Thin women made him joyful, but fat women made him giddy. He himself was a magnificent beast of a man, tall and broad, with virile good looks, powerful chest muscles, and a set of golden curls that fell to his neck, capturing the sunlight and adding a reflective glint to the deep sapphire eyes that drew his conquests in, hypnotising them and fooling them into believing that there was poetry hidden beneath his beauty. His only blemish was a horizontal scar across his left cheek, the result of a childhood argument with another boy. But this imperfection only enhanced his splendour, for without it, women said, he would have been so exquisite that he could scarcely have been called a man at all. Skilled in the ways of seduction, he rarely faced opposition to his desires, taking whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted, regardless of class, age, or marital status. Indeed, Marinus was as likely to be found in a virgin's bed as her grandmother's, and on the rare occasions when his advances were rebuffed, he assumed the woman suffered from a disorder of the mind, and took her anyway, for he recognised no one's rights but his own, and those of his peers within the Roman legion. He was a brute, certainly, but people adored his company, and I, like them, was desperate for him to love me, to show some added favour towards me as his son. This was a battle I would never win. When Marinus and Floriana first met, my mother was promised to another man in only a week from her wedding. She was not in love, of course, but a woman who felt any emotion other than gratitude towards the man who had chosen her would have been regarded as an eccentric. The marriage had been, re had been brokered by her father, Nevius of Bethlehem, who accompanied her to the marketplace that morning to negotiate with one of the street vendors over the price of his raisins. While the men haggled, Floriana slipped away, making her way towards one of the textile stalls, where she ran her hand across some, uh, along some cloth that the trader claimed had been imported from the kingdom of Vanga at great expense. Very beautiful, he assured her, placing his hands together, as if in prayer, to convince her of her honesty. In that distant place, women make their dresses from these fabrics, and their husbands fill their bellies with many babies. It was while Floriana was inspecting the man's wares that my father emerged from the doorway of a nearby house and caught sight of her for the first time. He had spent the morning in bed with the wife of a local tax collector, ravaging her three times in quick succession as payback for the percentage of his wages he was forced to return to the imperial purse. But his erotic spirits were ignited once again when he saw the great beauty standing on the other side of the street. He observed the sensual manner in which her fingers stroked the material, her tongue run, running across her upper lip in pleasure as she caressed the cloth, and felt a longing inside him, different to the basic desire for sex that stalked his every waking moment. Here was a new emotion, igniting in the pit of his stomach before coursing through his veins. Sensing his gaze, my mother turned and glanced in his direction, flushing immediately, for she had never looked upon so handsome a man before. 
For her too, something had lain dormant inside, began to stir. She was only 16 years old, after all, and the man to whom she was betrothed was almost three times her age, and so corpulent that he was known to all as the great elephant of Beit Sahur. They had met only once when he came to inspect her at her father's home, as one would scrutinise a brood mare, and I imagine she was anticipating the wedding night, if she even knew what it involved, with a mixture of dread and resignation. Now it took an act of will on her part to turn away from Marinus, and, unsettled by such alien emotions, she made her way from the stall in search of a quiet place to catch her breath. Before she could go too far, however, he had crossed the street and was standing before her. "'You would walk away from me?' he asked, smiling, barely cognizant of the musk of perspiration and sex that emanated from his body. He visited the bathhouse only once every few weeks, when the stink from his pores became too much even for his own nostrils. But somehow his aroma often proved an intoxicating perfume. "'Do I know you?' she asked. "'Not yet,' he replied, breaking into a wide smile that allowed the dimple on his right cheek to reveal itself and the scar on his left to whiten. But that's easily re remedied. He took a step back before bending at the waist to offer a polite bow. Marinus Caius Ubelius, a member of the Roman garrison, stationed here in Judea. And you are? The daughter of Nevius of Bethlehem, she said, casting a quick look to the other side of the market, where her father was still lost in negotiations. The merchant, asked my father, yes. But you have a name of your own too, I suppose. Floriana. I'm surprised that such a man would allow his daughter to walk the streets alone. I'm not alone, she said, daring to play with him a little. I'm with you. But I'm a very dangerous man, he replied. I have a reputation. My mother blushed. Already he had gone too far for her. In fact, he's just over there, she added, nodding in her father's direction. Perhaps you should continue on your way. He may not take kindly to you addressing me. Marinus shrugged his shoulders. You come to the marketplace with your father, he asked, instead of your husband. I have no husband. My heart rejoices. But I will a week from today. My heart grieves. He looked away, considering the probable chain of events that lay over the days ahead. And as he considered various options for ridding her of her betrothed, my grandfather marched over to protest against the young man's insolence at addressing his daughter in a public place. Floriana drew her veil across her face and took a step backwards as Nevius stood before them, insisting he would summon the Roman guards if this stranger dared to behave in such a disrespectful fashion ever again. But I am of their number, said my father. Marinus Caius Obelius, he added, offering another bow, hoping his manner would suggest that he was a man of good character. Nevius hesitated now. My daughter is a married woman, he said forcefully. No, he said, her wedding day is yet to come. A matter of seven days, that's all. And then, seven days is a long time, replied my father. We might all be dead in seven days, or seven minutes. Surely I might be allowed to offer my own proposal before it is too late. I mean you no disrespect, sir, but when a man encounters such a great beauty as your daughter, it is only natural he should seek to make her his wife. Don't you agree? I do, said Nevius, but it's impossible. Why? Because of the great elephant of Beit Sahur. And what has he to do to anything? He is to be my husband, said my mother. You would give your daughter to the great elephant of Beit Sahur? Asked my father, infusing his tone with as much outrage as he could summon. A man who was so fat he could scarcely fit through his own doorway. A man known to break the backs of the unfortunate donkeys, tasked with carrying him. Why, he would crush every bone in her body on their wedding night, if he could even find his cock within that vile mass of quivering blubber. The great elephant of Beit Sahur, no, sir, the great whale, the great whale. He is a man with a healthy appetite, it is true, conceded my grandfather, but he's also wealthy, one of the wealthiest merchants in this region, and he's been widowed for almost a month, so it's natural he would seek a new woman. Did he not kill his last two wives, asked Marinus. Yes, but they were unfaithful to him, so he was within his rights. Then your daughter wanders into dangerous territory, said Marinus. I wonder that a man of your dignity and reputation could permit such a match when a better opportunity stands before her. So that's the first chapter of A Traveller at the Gates of Wisdom. And um, after that, we move into 51 other countries and across the 2,080 years. 
So it's time to say goodbye now. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for some more Alliance Francaise events.